between. But I was going to uh, suggest that social work includes more uh, coordinating services mm -hmm. um, besides just the employer uh, job analysis or any return to work services. Uh, social work is probably going to be doing more uh, medical management, maybe, and um, additional coordinating of a variety of services. But like I said, I could be completely wrong. That's that's just my understanding. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yep. All right. You can go ahead and share the slides, uh, Kennedy. You see. Oh, you got it. And then with that, just as a disclaimer, uh, we don't hold any rights or affiliations to any particular training material used. We're not affiliated with any particular organizations or entities. We're just a group of people coming together to study. Hold Thank on. you. Hold on. Let, let me, I think I shared the wrong screen. Stop sharing. Share. There we go. Everything looks good. Right. Yeah, correct. All right. Um, so today we are discussing uh, rehabilitation, counseling, disability, and healthcare case management. Um, so I put a lot of information, but I'll trying to be brief and if you have any questions, we can uh, try to answer each other. So the key concept here is that uh, case management has consistently been uh, identified by CRC, uh, certified rehabilitation counselors as one of the most important function that uh, rehabilitation counselors perform. Um, and it's also very important that for rehab counselor to understand and how to apply case management techniques, um, and the process their own work, but also understand the different case management approaches of other professions as well. Um, the rehabilitation counselors, counseling clients, they are, as we all know, the population that we work with, they are frequently engaged in medical care or other professional services, um, a more aspect of living and working with a disability individuals or people with chronic illness. Um, and that's the rehabilitation counseling knowledge and tasks related to medical treatment and other services that including understanding on how to use medical information in developing rehabilitation and treatment planning, understanding the insurance and healthcare system and establishing uh, treatment goals that accommodate and meet uh, the client healthcare need, and also wellness and safety needs in planning services and referrals. Next. So there's a different types of knowledge that are important to consider when it comes to case management um, in the focus in this here focused on the three domains, uh, case management, healthcare, and community resource. So these, um, they have, they are consistently on key elements that case management is ongoing, like most definition that is ongoing and cooperative co collaborative process. Also case management definition, most of them, they include that. I mean, I, I got this actually from the red book and it has like three or four definitions, but the key point from every definition of the case management, a ongoing cooperative or collaborative process. And they also say that um, case management is a process that involves professional and of of course, the client, the individual that we work with. And also um, this process typically involve assessment, planning, coordination of services and resource and monitoring or tracking and evaluating the progress of the individuals that we work with. Um, commonly identified outcomes or purpose of case management include quality, outcome, efficiency and cost effectiveness. And all this is on the favor of the client to make sure that um, they are getting quality services of their uh, service that we offer as a rehab counselor. Next. 
Um, the case management skills and tasks in the rehabilitation counseling process, it involves intake, interviewing assessment, evaluation, planning, evaluating, and coordinating, um, evaluating the rehabilitation planning and related services, recording and report of case information. Um, I know most of like I where I work as a mental health clinicians, like usually do that, like intake interviewing to understand like the area of concern, the assessment, then they develop their uh, treatment assessment and evaluation planning. So I don't know if anybody here has any concern or any different that the way they do on their um, workplace. that is different, especially those work as a rehab counselor. Is it, does it include it the same as like intake, interviewing assessment, evaluation, planning, evaluation, and coordinating, or is it like a little different? Is it, um, anybody has anything to contribute on that? Or is it well understood? I understand, but where I work and stuff like that, we always do an intake. I mean, our coordinators actually do the intake and then once they do the intake, gather all the information, sign all the consents, do all the whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. then we meet with the um, client with all that paperwork. We, we reviewed it and everything like that. And that's when we sit down and um, address if we need to do like a vocal assessment or if we feel like their psychiatric eval or psychological is out of date and we want to get another one. So that's the time. And then after we get all that done, then we go into actually what they want to do in, in trying to develop uh, if we're going to use a community rehab um, agency or, or with us or a direct placement or whatever like that. So it's pretty much, you know, it's it's pretty much the same uh, in a sense, you know, it, it, either way it go to intake and interviewing is the first process and everything. Right. So, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A anybody has any other concern or is pretty much following the, is including pretty much everything here, correct? Okay, I'll assume that is as a yes. Um, so case management is utilizing across each of these components through, though each may be associated with like specific, of course, we know that every case is a uh, specific case management task that such as assessment, planning, coordinating of services and resource, uh, monitoring or tracking and evaluating of progress, uh, recording and reporting case management functions, knowledge, and uh, abilities um, in this part, like, you know, that like as case management, we consider like the individual's ability as well and trying to understand the level of care that they need as individuals. I'll go to the next page. Um, so case load management. The process of, the practice and process involved in the case management of total case load as opposed to a single client and include um, prior, such as prioritizing and selecting which case to work with currently accurately estimating the amount of time that will require for each case moving from one case to another and establishing a system to ensure and monitor progress across all cases. Um, I know that some people, I, I have worked in different places and people get a different number of case loads. What was your experience? You feel like most like the, the, the case load, how many clients according to your experience in your workplace have you been come across with? Like how many clients on your case load you can manage? When I was, when I was at the VA, it was, it was normal to have 150 to 200. The, uh, the location I'm at right now, it's private rehab, and it seems like 20 to 40 is kind of the average. So how often, I, when I hear like 100 plus clients, I, I feel like it's a lot. Uh, how, how often do you meet with these individuals? Like how, what do you do like as a direct uh, support for the client? So I'm not sure what the 
Uh, I can't speak for other federal or uh, state demands, but I know the VA uh, tends to have a higher burnout rate uh, because the demands are higher um, mm -hmm. in relation to making sure uh, consistent communication is made with all clients on the caseload. Uh, I believe if I can remember right, a discussion with a client at least once a month was the requirement, but I could be wrong. I could be mistaken there, um, which doesn't seem like much, but uh, it, it gets trickier than you think it would be. Okay, okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else has a different um, like number of caseload that they're working with their uh, clients? I do. Um, well, just real quick about the VA, if they're doing vocational rehab and employment, they may talk with their clients once or twice a year if I bad. That's how bad it is. Oh, it wow. Is good, but you talk very little and you do a lot more paperwork, my understanding. Mm. Um, so like if you don't want to talk to people, you just want to process stuff, then you go to then, then go go work at VR and you'll be fine. <laughs> um free introverts, just kidding. Uh, my case right now is sitting at about between 30 to 40, but that's because I'm through a grant funded program called WIOA. So mm -hmm. my caseload is dependent on how much funds we have, but the turnaround time to get them through their training and the job can sometimes be pretty quick, or we got just a couple of them that are long-term. Just depends on what they need. Now, I, I'm required to talk to my clients at least monthly, and I okay. try to do the best I can with that. It's a little bit of a struggle managing it, Mm -hmm. But um, I, I will say that it is a it is a learned skill to be a case manager. That's not something that people are naturally good at. So it, it's a very learned I, skill. I, and you really have to be willing to humble yourself and just mm -hmm. be willing to work with your clients, even if they're difficult. Mm, I agree. And does that, uh, for example, like for the client case load that you get, does it matter the function or you'll find someone like high function the low function, like how does it look like you like your case load? It doesn't really matter the um, level of functioning. So my clients, they can be anything, so it doesn't matter. Um, they can be fully functioning fine, or they can be, they may have some sort of disabilities, but if for instance, if they're like dealing with social security and trying to find a job, then they're gonna to go to the vocational rehab department. But if they have a disability and they want to go through our program, they can. Just depends on what it is. It may be a cold enrollment, what we would call that. Okay, right. thank you mm -hmm. for sharing. You can go to the next slide. Um, okay, this is important part as a rehabilitation counselor, um, case recording and documentation that um, there's essential case and case um, management responsibilities. So records, it's any physical recording made information related to counselor, professional practice. Um, those following here is a specific example of record that rehabilitation counselor can be expected to encounter or manage, uh, which is clinical case notes, appointment books, billing, payment account, um, copies of correspondence such as email and transcript, signed informed consent documentation, client permission to release of information, um, intake forms, audio video recordings, session with the client. I know some people do uh, like video recording. Uh, I remember when I was doing my internship back then, they like my supervisor will ask to do like video recording with a client. So they have to like sign um, the consent form for that um and also like make sure that client is being uh, sufficient with the service that we are providing so record keeping is mandated by both um certified reputation counselor code of professional ethics for reputation counselor and the american counseling association code of ethics because it is deemed necessary to render quality of professional services um records are often subject to being sub Emma and counselor need to be prepared to respond to any legal demand for record and to transfer them to a third party if necessary and appropriate. There's no general law that states how long record must be kept, but several state counselor license law dictate that counselor keep record for a certain number of years 
such as 10 years after the last client. Actually, I saw some kind of question like this, how many record has to be kept like in the 10, 15 years, 20 years. So maybe that's a good uh, eye catching there. Um, do you guys, anybody, anyone here that maybe like mandated to do maybe recording sessions, like what is your experience on um, case recording and docu documentation part? Nobody? Okay, we can go to the next slide. A principal modules and documentation format for biopsychosocial case consideration and treatment planning. What is biopsychosocial model of disability? Is the basis of um, WHO ICF and is adopted and used in a clinical setting and also to structure clinical and organizational guideline. Biopsychosocial module is a holistic approach that asset that disability results from the interactions of biological, psychological, social, and environmental factors. So in biopsychosocial, we consider all those factors um, as mentioned to make the um, clinical recommendations. Um, there is five essential elements that should be considered in conceptual definition of VR that are consistent with ICF uh, framework and has provided biopsychosocial approach to case con conceptualizations. Uh, first, the focus should be on engagement or reagreement, rearrangement with work as an outcome be the process unfold along with work, continuing acknowledging times and phase. And then the process involves various health conditions or events that lead to work disability. D, the approach is both patient-centered and evidence-based in um, successful balance, subjective and objective influence. The intervention is multi-professional and multidisciplinary. Okay, go to the next. Unless anybody want to talk anything about that. Okay, I can go to the next. Um, case management modules. So there is about one, two, three, four, five, six uh, modules that is mentioned um, that as a rehab counselor and other professional may adopt. And every module here has their definition. Um, the broker module is designed for brief client services and it focus on assessment, organization, and coordination of services and involve relatively uh, little client involvement. Assistive module, community treatment module, and the strength-based module are based on longer service duration and involve more extensive and intensive client contact and the clinical involvement. The clinical case management module involves assessment and coordination of care designed around an individual tailored uh, rehabilitation or care plan, but require that the case manager is also a clinician who provide counseling therapy or education. Um, I saw one of the question I was, uh, I saw like the different modules and they ask like, they give the definition and asking like what type of module. So it's something maybe to kind of be mindful of the um, definitions of these modules as well. That's why I try to put them on. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. the, the, these different models, all of those um, individuals here who work in um, case management, do you use any of these models as part of you know, the case management, is there one that you use more than others? I mean, do they mean anything? Can anybody try to answer question that um, of the people that work in the field as uh, rehabilitation counselor or case management? Um, I was just thinking about this myself. I'm just gonna time it for me. Mm -hmm. I think in my job, I feel like it's the brokerage model because we do the service, we focus on the assessment, we do everything we need, but then, you know, most of the clients, they tend to take care of themselves. There's not a whole lot of expenses, but it seems like one's more 
detailed than the other. So I guess it's just the level of involvement. But I would say maybe in my role, sounds like it's a brokerage model, which kind of like that term. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think that we use those terms commonly. But yeah, I want to hear from other people. What What about your uh, experience? Do you do like a clinical case? Or a Go for it. I, I think I do them all. I mean, we have so many, we have so many clients, like I have to have adults and students and uh, we, we have, they, they can come in from the internet. So we have to do so many intake days ourselves. Oh we have to do intake days ourselves to intake and place other, you know, other clients. And then some of the students that age out and want to go uh, into uh, college. So I do college cases, college case summaries, uh, <laughs> Uh, paying for their college, keeping up with their records, grades, different things like that. Then for the students that are in school and all like that, collecting data. So I think I do every last one of these and then that's Cassie. Okay, thank you, Cassie. My sister's in my caseload, I have 636 uh, children and that's not including my adults. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and to say he feel like he's doing more broken module. In my workplace, I feel like I'm doing more the clinical case module because I do a lot of um, assessment and I look if clients need other services and then I refer them to uh, other services. Um, and then I do a lot of like counseling, but that goes both to the client and the client's family as well. Cause I've been working with um, young teenager, like maybe like, preteen to teenagers um so that i feel like that my part fall into clinical case module as a clinician we can go to the next um the strength based case management module there are three core principles of the strength based case uh, management module that is promotions of the use of informal helping networks offering a steady community involvement and emphasizing on the relationship between the client and the case manager. Um, the starting point in this case, that management module is, a, is an assessment of the individual current thought and feelings regarding their circumstance and exploring their capability and asset and how they can draw on this resource to respond to the challenge they're facing. Um, and also including on identifying the specific goals uh, to develop a treatment plan, which lead by the individual's own perception and report the service they need. Uh, this model is consistent with rehabilitation counselor asset uh, focus philosophy. Also, the focus on the deficit and negative aspect of one situation can be expected to lead to low level of self efficacy and also can um, and also lead either to hold in negative perceptions, stereotype about disability uh, that limit many potential social and opportunities. Then go to the next. Documentation format. A uh, rehab counselor may admit uh, that a variety of ICF based and other intakes form uh, and assessment to clients include uh, biological, psychological, and social history circumstance. Uh, the biopsychosocial history in particular is widely used in biopsychosocial case conceptualizations, particularly in mental and behavioral health setting. Um, the form of allowed documentation of the client current primary and secondary presentation problems, like uh, well, their current problems, emotional psychiatrics, family history, medical history, substance use history, developmental and uh, social economic. So in summary, biopsychosocial model of case management is used to understand a client's circumstance and presenting issues from multiple angles. angles. Uh, this approach is consistent with the rehab counselor's philosophy and is necessary as a client concern, uh, often complex and rapidly changing and affect by um, biological, psychological, and social and environmental factor and influence. Um, you can go to the next. Techniques for working effectively in terms and across our uh, disciplines. Um, as indicated in, um, 
CRC ethical practice require that rehabilitation counselor recognize that the quality of interaction with the colleague can influence the quality of services provi provided to the client. Um, the attitudinal char characteristics have been identified as being helpful, promoting interdisciplinary collaborative, including collaborative attitude, willingness to share and uh, collaborate, <coughs> respect others' professional uh, in the team as well. And the attitude of collaborating also requires being on the flexible, which means that collaborators should understand the limitation of their own professional orientation and be willing to learn about other professionals' perspective. Mm -hmm. Rehabilitation counselor may also need to show openness to collective um, decision makings and the ability to redefine their roles in interpersonal context. And interdisciplinary practice require rehabilitation counselor to have professional knowledge of their own expertise, the capability of effective communication, um, and also rehabilitation counselor may need to learn about the language used by the specific nature of raw professional from different different you know, disciplining and understanding. Interpersonal and group dynamic is also extremely helpful um, as a professional and also knowledge about organizing and system theory and consulting model help as, as a rehab counselor, better understanding the complex dynamic within interdisciplinary team. Um, the ethical practice requires that when engaging in formal and informal interdisciplinary consultation, consultation, rehabilitation counselor uh, refrain their discussion confidential, um, information that reasonable could lead to identifying of client unless client consent has been obtained. You can go to the next. Negotiation, medication, and conflict resolution strategies. Um, sometimes as, a, as a, a people that are working in, in this field, we may have the conflict may arise um, based on client perspective of being maybe wronged by the clinician or wronged by the counselor, uh, wrongdoing by the intentional or unintentional um, or lack of competence. I know they always say that like, we have to be careful working with the population that we're working with because some people just because of their um, areas of need, their diagnosis or whatever they are going through, they, they just become very sensitive to the things. So just being um, careful on the language that we use with the individual that we work with. Um, some common identified conflict include breaching of confidentiality, counselor practice outside of their areas of expert or counselor engaging in inappropriate and ethical dual relationship with the client. Um, in one way or another, the client can be feel harmed or offended. Uh, anybody has come across with a um, scenario that the client maybe has reported them on something and made like kind of big deal out of it? Any, anyone has experience on that? Okay. okay. Thank God, no. <laughs> no okay. That wouldn't be good. I say, thank God, no. <laughs> you want to try to not get it to that point. I mean, yes, some of them get mad. Some of them are unrealistic in their goals and different things like that. But it's a way around. You would never want it to get, you know, out of hand and everything right. like that. So you just try to, you know, find a medium. And they got the two different types of that you'll be going into the informal and informal. Um, All right you know, things. So you come into that. So you always want to try to do the informal before you get to the, all of this is considered formal to me. So, yeah. But, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the input. Um, so Remley and Haley propose the following guideline to avoid unnecessary conflict um, and ethical problems in the counseling process. Say Rex Restrict your practice of counseling to your area of competence. Do not sue client for unpaid fees. Utilize a thorough and complete client disclosure statement in your practice. Never guarantee or imply a guarantee of an outcome. Establish and maintain firm professional boundaries between yourself and your client. And usually always use uh, supervision. Stay, 
stay connected with fellow men mental health professional, monitor your own disclosure document carefully and keep current with developmental and um, relevant state and national laws, professional ethics, and continually monitor your own um, effectiveness as a counselor. You know, go next. Advocates process to address an institutional and a social barrier that um, better the client access, equity, and success. What it is advocates is promoting the well-being of the individual group and the professional within system and organizations by seeking fair treatment and full physical and uh, programmatic access for client and the removal of barrier any barrier or obstacle that inhibit access growth and um, development advocacy is important competent for rehab counselor process and rehab counselors professional um and we usually uh been argued to advocate for our individuals um in order to promote the opportunity any access improve the quality of life for individual with disability um remove potential barrier to provision of, of or access to service um so this response responsibility may include identifying and addressing environmental adjuna attitudinal barriers, including stereotyping and discriminations. It also empower the client that their representative to be self-advocate by providing information and resources that will facilitate self-advocates at the level of rehabilitation counselor organization. Rehab counselors should be vigilant about potential barrier to access uh, equitable services provision. As, as a rehab counselor, also we should uh, respect the client capacity of self advocates and obtain client consent before engaging in um, advocates or on behalf of, of the client. I mean, uh, some of the clients that we work with, they're really like really low functioning, so they do require our support to stand and um, advocate for, for them to make sure that they get the care or the services that they deserve and meet their need. Um, in case we are advocating on client behalf require the disclosure of confidential information, rehab counselors should first obtain a written or documented client concert in order to be effective advocate or whether specific client for person with disability more broadly, rehab counselor must acknowledge about a relevant law, policy related to employment, education, transportation, housing, civil rights, um, financial benefits, and various services. Also, a rehab counselor should refer client to only, only to program facility, facility or employment settings that are appropriate um, based on their level of functioning and also um, perceived membership in a particular group, class, or category, and they should collaborate with the client to identify and develop a plan to um address the barrier to services so this is like client really focused like um address their need and engage them in decision making or the level of care that they need you can go next techniques for working with individuals with limited english uh options. Um, individuals with LIP do not speak English as their primary language and have a limited um, ability to really speak, write, or understand English. Working with this population, it can be also a complex um, process that may challenge us as a professional across the professional setting. So effective communication is always the key. Um, um, and the language barrier sometimes can compromise uh, rehabilitation outcomes. Effective communication with individual with uh, LAP increase the effectiveness of counseling intervention, ensure client well-being and safety, and is consistent with mission of counseling agents in the law. The accurate cultural competent interpretation and the translation and the translations help ensure that individuals with uh, LEP understand the information service provide want to convey. Um, so usually 
anybody here has come across with a client that they don't speak English as their first language. And I get that all the time here where I live. <laughs> Fortunately, yeah. I have partner, I have uh, teammates who are bilingual, so not a big deal. Now, I haven't really come across uh, lately anybody who's like other than English, so to speak. But um, for the most part, I live in a very bilingual town, so you're gonna come across yeah. people who are Spanish speaking only. It's a little difficult yeah. for me, but I managed to get through it. Okay. Yeah, I, I have come across with that too. Uh, I speak English as my uh, second language. Sometimes I work with a client and they don't feel comfortable. As a provider, they don't feel comfortable with like, oh, you have, she have an accent, maybe we need someone else. So I feel like it's not just for clients, as a provider too also, sometimes we, we meet with those challenges. And it's not like somebody that really cannot understand you, but they just feel like, oh, you have an accent. How many languages do you speak? That's like, personally, I came across with that as my experience as a provider. Um, but I guess in this case, it's a little bit different that as a rehab counselor, we require to make sure that the client understanding the information that um, uh, we give and the support, they have the clear understanding based on their um, languages as well. So resource for rehab counselor working with individual with LAP, the provision of interpreters or oral language and the translator, written language using bilingual clinical and the administrative training services provided in a second language is most common spoken by the agents. Um, and also training the interpreter and the clinicians to work together can improve the delivery of rehabilitation services. And also here, they just make the recommendation that when you speak with the client, try to make a note. Um, if they give short answers, try to ask them question. Maybe they didn't know they understand. So kind of try really to make sure that um, they open up a little bit and uh, language is not an issue. You can go to the next. Medical intervention resource and healthcare benefit and delivery system. There are multiple ways in which the work for rehab counselors may overlap with medical and aligned health professional and healthcare system, which include through participation of interdisciplinary treatment teams, advocating for client and health wellness, through the vocational evaluation process and work hardening program, through the client ongoing or needed participation in speech, physical occupations, or other therapies, participating in substance use, uh, psychiatrist, or pain management treatment in the end of the housing, like modification in the coordination of care and life planning, and numerous other aspects of working with the client in any various setting in which rehab counselors are employed. Um, so no, ethically, rehab counselors are expected to be knowledgeable about the system law organization policy that affect the access of medical and mental health um, for individuals with disability. And to keep current with the changes in these areas in order to advocate effectively for uh, facilitated for self advocates of clients in these areas. You can go next. Healthcare benefit and delivery system. So people with disability have always fed, um, faced a significant barrier to healthcare, including um, difficulty assessing private difficulty assessing private health insurance. This discrimination based on pre-existing conditions, um, benefit limit and exclusion, and the risk of losing coverage on short notice. So Americans with disability face numerous barriers to accessing healthcare services, even with insurance coverage, including limited accessibility of medical facilities, a lack of provider education and disability awareness, communication barriers, stereotype and misconceptions, a lack of care coordinations and lack of uh, accessible and reliable transportations. Go next. <coughs> Anybody has questions here? All right, you can go next. 
Kenneth. Hello. Um, Sorry, I'll be right back. You're good. Sorry about that. Okay. Are you going? Okay, are you going from here? No. Uh, categories of healthcare, primary care, preventive care, ca catastrophic care, mental health care, chronic care, long-term care. Uh, federal law con re federal laws regulate the insurance industry, including the um, COBRA health benefit provision passed by the Congress in 1986, HIPAA enacted by the Congress in 1996, and um, FMLA. Actually, I saw a question that in the red book related to these um, categories of healthcare, but it, they were asking about uh, caring for the baby. I don't remember the question, uh, but I think the it was talking about like what type of um, what type of insurance that cover like caring for the baby or having adopted a child which was uh, which was the answer was the family and medical leave act you can go next private health insurance so there is 67.3 percent of the u.s population had private health insurance coverage um a majority covered by the employer and 34.4 percent had public health insurance um this is was um uh but the data does back in 2018. Uh, specific category of essential health benefits required to be covered includes emergency, we all know, emergency services, hospitalization, maternity, newborn care, pediatric services, prescription drugs, mental health and substance use disorder services, and chronic disease management. You can go next. Okay, are you next to here? Um, you know what? Is it coming up? Is it, okay. Uh, yeah, this is me. All okay, right. all right. <laughs> all right. All right, so just jumping into here real quick. Uh, this area is called managed care concepts. Basically, uh, it's just the managed care concept is literally a fancy term to organize costs for medical coverage. So your health insurance is a managed care, is part of a managed care type concept. So just a little background history, it really came into effect in the 1960s up to 2018, the healthcare costs rose from 15 to 20%. Then it rose significantly from 23 to 2015 up to 868 billion, more than 54% of Medicare and 70% of Medicaid, which you're gonna to need to know the difference between the two, which I'll talk here shortly, expenditures were associated with a disability. Majority of them are. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, healthcare insurance is needed, state and federal. So with that, when we're talking about healthcare insurance plans, uh, and an overview, insurance organizations contract with providers who provide care for insured members at reduced cost, quote unquote. Uh, it includes a provider in and out, provides in-person or out-of-person network or in-provider and out-of-provider network. I'm sure most of you know what that means. Uh, limits what service providers can do and how long a patient can be admitted. With that too, there are some main types, which is depending on your field where you're going into, let us say private rehab, you might only be able to take certain types of health insurances, maybe an HMO or POS, or maybe a PPO. Um, if you're doing state and federal, it's a little bit different. I mean, you take VA insurance, and then if you're doing an actual like psychiatric facility, that facility only takes certain insurances. So. Um, with that, you have health maintenance, health maintenance organizations, PPOs, and point of service plans, which we'll talk about those shortly. Uh, they include now point of service plans. I related that more to like the Department of VA, Medicare, Medicaid, Cigna, Health Springs, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, etc. So, with that, uh, we if you go back to the beginning of the lecture when we first started this. Um, 
We know that the establishment of Medicare Medicaid happened more or less 1965. Social Security was in 1935, uh, but Medicare Medicaid really became prominent in 1965 due to rising healthcare costs. It was a federal program. Uh, with that, it operates under the Centers for Medical Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So if you wanted to go work for them, you could. Uh, now, with that, there's some key notes. Who here is not familiar with the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Okay. So I think most people are, especially in our Actually, field. Actually... Uh -huh. Actually, if you could touch a little bit on it, that'd be that'd be great. Um, I I'd like to think I know enough about both, but I know that uh, Medicare is covered by SS or SSDI is eligible for Medicare, and SSI is eligible for Medicaid. But I'm not 100% on the actual differences between the two insurance company or insurance uh, groups. Wow. Okay. Plans. Got you. So the key thing is age, literally. Okay. Uh, so if you look at Medicaid here, written it, this is authorized by the title. 16. Thank you. <laughs> it's a long name. <laughs> <I read laughs> 16. Uh, this is usually regarding people uh, who are pregnant women, children, individuals receiving SSI, or they, they were eligible for supplemental security income, maybe like those who may have had some long-term conditions or health issues. Uh, with that, even though it's a federal mandated program, it's state ran. So like if you right now, Andrew, will probably with your family will qualify for Medicaid because your wife has just got pregnant. And if you receive an SSI, you can potentially get Medicaid. Now, if mm -hmm. you're getting in, let's say Chicago or New York, there's going to be more additional services that are available to you that they wouldn't give in other states. Like in New York, for instance, they give more things like dental care, vision, and so forth. Here in Texas, you'll lose your teeth if you can't afford a cost for dental work. They don't cover that. And it may be very limited or cover very limited on uh, vision when they're able to afford it. Ultimately, it's, it's state-based. But that's important for you because depending on your work setting, if they're trying to get back to work and you need to know what insurance there are, for billing, say you're doing a private insurance, that's what's going to help you. Now, with that being mentioned, Medicare is designed for people who are 65 years or older. So not to joke on, not to Josh or joke on anybody here, but when you turn 65, you are eligible for, for Medicare. And regardless of your income or health status, you can get Medicare. So that's the difference. Medicaid is like is this like an aid for the general population, working people, youth, and so forth. Medicare are for your uh, seniors or those with uh, disability insurances, SSDI. Those are your people who cannot work. So Medicare. Okay, so uh, go for it. So if you if you mm -hmm. are an SSI or SSDI recipient for at least at least two years, but you haven't reached the age of 65, you'd be eligible then for Medicare. Correct. Uh, gotcha. one, of my best, one of my best friends, he, he had a uh, weird condition happen to him, a very rare uh, genetic disease. And uh, because of that, he was, he was, when he was young, he was disabled. And so although he was underneath his father's private insurance, because of his unique disability, he qualified for SSDI. So for the rest of his life, he'll always be able to receive Medicare. Now, um, for with that, so even when he hit a certain age, but when he was younger, he used to receive, I believe, was SSI, was the SSI portion. So he had reached a certain age where he was no longer in his parents, and then he went to Medicare. So a lot of it really just depends on your situation and which sections you qualify for. Uh, did anybody else want to chime in or comment or maybe clarify? I might have missed something. No? Perfect. All right. So now, a little thing I want to mention about Medicare, because a lot of our clients, if they're disabled, if they have a chronic illness or a chronic disability, they're more than likely going to be underneath the Medicare plan, receiving SSDI. So it's a good thing to understand, depending on what insurance has. 
there is this whole thing as like part A, B, C's, and D's. So like, why do these letters matter to me? Well, depending on where your work practice is that if they're not paying fees, maybe they're not charging you to the right insurance, just for an example. So part A re related to paying the hospital insurance coverages. That was the original intent for Medicare plans, as well as part B. Those were the two original plans for Medicare plans. And then the other ones that were new are part C's and D's. So basically, <laughs> pardon this comment here, uh, part B is supplementing medical insurance for providers and office and wellness business. So like your uh, in-network, out-of-network providers, you're going to go get your annual physical, annual checkup, that kind of stuff. Now part C, and I do call this a ripoff. Um, okay. Okay, so Brittany just mentioned here that there is a question about A, B, and C, and D. So definitely, I appreciate you disposing that. Make sure you read it too. Because in Part C, Medicare Advantage plans, which I say is a part that kind of can rip people off, uh, plans offered through private companies approved by Medicare. So your grandmother or your mother who's a senior receives a phone call saying, hi, my name is Jesse from Medicare Advantage Plan. We want to get you into a better insurance to help you. Would you be willing to work with us? Those are private companies approved by Medicare, if they're approved by Medicare, trying to get you onto another plan that pays more. Now, for some people who are middle upper class, maybe it works better for them. But for the majority of our clients, that may not be beneficial. So keep in mind, um, what the situation is but i'm just sharing that with you because i hear those phone calls all the time for seniors saying oh yeah they keep telling me to get on this medicare advantage plan when i'm not realizing they're trying to get them from this here to part c then the last one is part d voluntary outpatient prescription drug benefits basically it's a discount program for medication so why should this matter to you Depending on the level of Social Security disability income the person qualifies for is also going to determine the type of insurance plans that they, they are able to get into or are eligible for. And that may affect the type of services you're going to do as a case manager providing them what they need. If they can only get voluntary outpatient prescription benefits and you're trying to revert them to mental health counseling and they don't have this part, it might cost them something out of pocket. So you might have to figure out as the case management part what resources available to them for either free counseling or maybe low uh, uh, discounted prices for counseling. That's why this will be important. Uh, does anybody want to share or chime in their thoughts on that or maybe they've had any experience with that? Nobody? Okay. All right, let's keep going then. But thank you again, Brittany. Uh, just make sure you read that part A, A through D. And keep in mind, that's only applicable to Medicare, not to Medicaid. Hey, Kennedy, I also oh. mentioned that um, I heard like the case management, like that's a big part of the CRC. So just like this, all this information is great. Appreciate you, Brittany. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So definitely we, we, we'll we'll touch a bit more on this. So yeah, with that too, and you know, it kind of makes sense because we do need an understanding because depending on our work setting, it <laughs> lets us know what we can and cannot do with the client. So appreciate you, Brittany. Um, so with that, uh, for group disability insurance, this is stuff that's usually offered to you from employers. Now, you got your state insurance benefits that they give you. Yes, that's kind of part of it, but we're talking about private corporations, contractors, and stuff like that. And so when it comes to group disability insurances, it, I believe this one was mandated, but I have to double check. It might be something else I'm mixing with. Um, <clears throat> the employer provides benefits to its employees with disabilities who are totally or partially disabled due to injury, illness, pregnancy, or psychiatric disorder. So if they say you're applying to a new job position and they say they got a, an amazing uh, 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 plan for you for health insurance and all that, they may also offer you something called short-term disabilities or long-term disability insurance, which I know for the work I'm at right now, I, I did apply for that, which I, I'm paying into that because if something was to happen to me, I expect them to still pay me money, you know, God forbid. So uh, keep in mind where you're working for, if they offer these things, I would recommend getting into them because it's just going to keep you and your family protected. 
Uh, so now the key thing here though, if let's say Andrew who does a private rehabilitation, if the person is only eligible for short-term disability, you have a very limited time to work with them, 26 weeks. Do 26 divided by what, four? I mean, if anybody's gonna go with math in their head, let them know, cause I'm not. That's six and a half months at most. Doesn't mean they're gonna be out of work for six and a half months, but he has up to six and a half months to work with them if they're eligible for short-term disability. This is what we're talking I would, about. Like, go I, would like to, I would like to say, uh, in the case that we have someone that has short-term disability, uh, that's the dis or that's the insurance that's utilized um, primarily. Once that's exhausted, then workers' compensation, uh, whether it's uh, temporary partial dis disability or temporary permanent disability or permanent partial disability or permanent disability insurance, um, kicks in. So uh, you are right in the sense that uh, because I work with workers' comp individuals, uh, but if it wasn't workers' comp related, yes, I would have only 26 weeks to work with them. But in my case, once the 26 weeks is, is exhausted, then the workers' compensation uh, compensation portion kicks in. No, you're right, Andrew. That's actually what I read in the book too. So I appreciate you uh, chiming in on that, but you're right. Um, with that. So then, like you said, from there, if it's going to take longer based, of course, on your assessment, um, then it could be 26 up to five years. And so, uh, like you were saying, depending on the situation, uh, it's going to depend whether or not they go long term. Now, what the book mentioned was terminal illnesses, prolonged mental health, and I'm talking about like severe psychiatric disorders, maybe uh, 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 somebody had an aneurysm and they have a stroke, so there's going to be a long term rehabilitation. A severe accidents or major illnesses. Uh, now, I don't understand, maybe, maybe you can chime in this, Andrew. Uh, what is the exceptions about if somebody's up, up to the age of 65? They can just automatically receive long-term disability? I'm actually not, I'm not too sure about uh, when it comes into uh, long-term disability because oh. I have, I have a client right now uh, who is over the age of 65 and he is not receiving uh, long-term disability. Um, That's what it is. I think it's only good up to 65 and then you cannot receive it afterwards. Oh, I see. I see what you're asking. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, would, that would make sense though. Yeah. Yeah. So after you hit a certain age, they just need to use their Medicare plan to take care of themselves. <laughs> is this all kind of to make, is, I'm hoping this is starting to make sense. So as uh, what Andrew mentioned here, and again, thank you for chiming in, short-term insurances, one to 12 months, long-term insured. Uh, this is individualized short-term uh, illness and long-term illnesses, so very similar. Uh, but for short-term insurance, uh, ranges one to 12 months. Long-term insured is a portion of monthly incomes paid to a qualified individual who are unable to work because of the total, it covered total disability. So... Other ones, um, which most companies, at least most states where they work at, required is the personal injury protection, which is a no fault. Uh, regardless of the situation, they can they can also receive for that. So if your company has it, apply for it. If you if not, or when you start renewing, uh, coverage this insurance pays for the cost of medical expenses, regardless who is at fault, and includes lost wages or earnings or out of pocket expenses. Another one, uh, this one. So now this here, uh, I'm gonna just kind of chime in a bit on this. There is a new thing happening within the field of rehabilitation counseling. I'm sure some of you are seeing this right now, maybe hearing it a lot, but it's health promotion and wellness. So rather than just say, oh, you're sick, let's just treat you. And since we're, since the cost of health insurance and everything is skyrocketing, there's a new initiative being put with the federal government and of course the many agencies to prevent and reduce the chances of instances of somebody getting sick or ill. So now, uh, what they're saying, according to the CRC, is that soon rehabilitation counselors should be also be looking at preventive measures to reduce the chances of that person getting sick or injured while at work and preventing any future clients from uh, maybe that company or whichever to get reduce them getting sick. So for instance, uh, what this is for health promotion awareness is based on the research, there are some three principles that they, that, that they assumed or that they learned. Poor health 
is associated with being unemployed. I think that pretty speaks a lot for itself. When you find somebody who's homeless in the street, they're not in the best of health. Being unemployed significantly increases the odds of poor general and physical mental health. When somebody doesn't have a meaningful production in their life, they stop. They stop living and they just exist. Order just slowly decaying. Health problems are a significant impediment to employment among un the unemployed age persons with disabilities. What that's saying there in a nutshell is that people with significant health problems may have a harder time finding a job, and because of that may potentially end up having poor health outcomes, being unemployed and being poor and not being able to take care of themselves and get the needs that they want. If you were here last week's lecture, I want to say Margaret touched on a great explanation with Social Security as far as calculating uh, the cost of putting somebody through a work program where, where if I was to lose some of my Social Security money, I would actually be making more money with my job, even though Social Security's lots cut off some of it and still getting more benefits. And I thought it was a really good example because not many people know about that. So if you haven't seen the video from last week, Please, 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 please read it, look at it. It's amazing. And it's the last hour. So, but that's basically what that's saying here. Any questions? Next one. Now, with that, uh, if you're familiar with the World Health Organizations, identifies the, the ICF models. They say that for the definition of health, it includes environmental and personal factors. We're talking about external influences, environmental and structural access, phys physical, social, and cultural, legal, political systems, as well as personal factors such as age, demographics, identity, and education to include individual uh, physiological features of the body, functions, and so forth. It's basically term health. Overall, in addition to that, when somebody is looking at health, you're looking at more than just one thing. It's, it's a multifaceted approach. So you're looking at one side of the, of the person's individual's overall health versus the other side. So in terms of health, you know that if somebody's living in a middle upper class area, getting a privatized education, maybe from a Catholic school or a Christian school or whatever, uh, and the family is a little bit upper age in wealth, their health outcome is going to be a lot better than if somebody is in the projects in the Bronx with family who have a history of drugs and abuse and a line of, of family members getting into gangs or dying young. That's a big factor. That also factors into wellness. It's different because it's the state of what a person thinks of themselves as. So by definition, wellness is a process or a way of living rather than an end state like health is that involves striving for achieving and maintaining optimum levels of well-being and health. So in one aspect, these are the things that influence the individual around them, and this is how the individual sees themselves. Therefore, you have health and wellness. Did I lose anybody? Or anybody want to comment or, or, or chime in? Nope. Okay. So now, with understanding the health and wellness, one of the things that us as rehabilitation counselors need to be able to do is help people become empowered with self-management, whether it's managing their time, whether it's managing their budget, whether it's giving them the tools that they need to self-care and take care of themselves, like basic grooming needs, if it's making sure that they have access to uh, certain services for them. That's the end goal is for them to take those tools and run with them so they don't have to come back to see us, <laughs> you know? And so with that, when we talk about self-management, it's basically learning and practicing the skills necessary to carry on an active and emotionally satisfying life in the face of a chronic condition. That's why we exist as rehabilitation counselors because our job is to empower them to get back into the workforce help them improve their health, and may have a better outcome for them in life, being what they call that, self-sufficient. So yeah. And basically, this pretty much is what, what touches right here. Policy on skills, education about the disability treatment, access, and so forth. 
So this this came directly out of the uh, book itself, which kind of just breaks down the concepts of what those terms are. Um, but for the most part, I mean, that's it's pretty much cut and dry. But now my question for you is this: Do any of you here use some sort of ICF or an integrated model where you have different disciplinaries come together to create a, a, a rehabilitation plan for a client? Has anybody here ever had the opportunity to work with a social worker, a clinical psychologist, a uh, wellness coordinator, or an occupational therapist providing rehab services for an individual? Nobody. Well, I, can tell I mean, you I know. have experience, uh, sorry, I have experience working with social workers, but not really necessarily providing services for a um, rehab counselor client is uh, pretty much more on the mental health wise. For mental yeah. health. Yeah. Hmm. So, like, uh, yeah, having no like, uh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. I got you. So you really just work with the social workers and the case manager. So in a, in a perfect world, you know, we would hope that the client can get all that together at once. But with today's insurances, policies, that limits us. But now here's the thing. In a way, you may work with them because if you're working on whether it's the state or federal side, you're going to be, excuse me, I might sneeze. Excuse me. Uh, you might actually get copies of medical records. And I'm not sure what you're looking in the medical records for, which of course you're looking for the disabilities, but you might want to know, um, did anybody do an, maybe a disease investigation? Where is this person located at when they were younger? Where were, what was their environment like at the time? What, what were the factors that led them to be who they are now? You know, uh, what previous treatments did they have in the past? Those kind of things. And so as a rehab counselor, we may not have enough time to look at that, but we need to understand those. So like that, if there is an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? I think this person might actually benefit by talking to a, a, a nutritionist. That maybe help reduce some of their, their pains for multiple cirrhosis, you know? This person might actually benefit if we send him to a um, physical therapist so he can get enough strength so he, can, so he can be sent to occupational therapy or whatever, you know? So we may not necessarily talk with each other interchangeably but that might be something to bring up within your own community saying hey we might want to start working with other agencies so like that these clients can get better so now with that there's also something called the models of health promotion and behavior which by the way thank you thank you so much for uh chiming in there rose i appreciate you um and with that there's actually one two three four five six models, but two of them relate to all these putting them together. So you get the health beliefs models, which is the values are placed by an individual on a particular goal of the individual's estimate of the likelihood that a given action that result in achieving that goal. Pretty much value to avoid illness and behaviors that prevent illness. Theories of reason action, which means the intention is influenced by one's attitude towards the behavior. The individual's belief will lead to a certain outcome, value attached by individuals to that outcome, and subject to norms. Please read the book. Theory of planned behavior. Pretty much health behavior is driven by behavior intentions. So if you're noticing something here, these sound very similar to our uh, theories, principles, and lectures because they are. They're just applied into health promotion. And then you have the social cognitive theory from Bandra. I think this one was 1989. Uh, he says that behavioral change and maintenance are a function of expectations about whether the behavior will achieve outcomes and or efficacy belief. Or in a matter of speaking, the expectations about one's ability to execute the behavior. Then there's the trans theoretical model. Health decision makes and describes the chances of pre-contemplation that describes the change, ch not chances, but changes from pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Sounds similar to a research application that we listened to a couple of weeks back. And also the health action process approach, or HAPA. It incorporates all of this, but puts it into a state of phase. 
phases. Pretty much in a nutshell, he just said, let's put everything together here because this is applicable to the person in regards to how they view themselves as in their health situation and wellness. And let's put them into specific phases because think of it this way. If a client's coming to you because their parents are telling them that they need to get seen by you, but they're not ready to address their issues, it's going to be hard to work with them. But if a person's coming to you because, you know, they're like, I did come with a recent disease. I, I'm not learning. I'm, I'm don't understand enough about it. I need to come to terms with it. Maybe a, a substance user with a du dual diagnosis. They're going to go through these stages. They're going to go through contemplating whether or not to receive it or to to pull forth through psychoeducation. They're going to be, be changing their thoughts and behaviors around themselves and how they view others. Uh, they want to know what you, you need to help them to understand what drives them to that addiction. Uh, with that, what is their some of their influence attitudes towards themselves and others? And then last, you know, what do they view themselves as being healthy? So no matter speaking, HAPA does incorporate all these. Any questions, thoughts, or concerns so far? I'll take that sign that says no, we we're getting this. Okay. So now with understanding health, health promotion and wellness. Let's talk about disability prevention and management or disability management. In a nutshell, it's a workplace program using prevention, early interventions, and return to work strategies to reduce the impact and cost of work, is work injury and disability with the aim of returning to employ with a disability to a productive schedule and employment. So there's different techniques to that. There's the proactive techniques which is to reduce occupational injuries like wellness programs, safety awareness, illness injury prevention, safety stand down, stuff like that. And then there's the reactive techniques, which I think rehab counselors really focus on is the employee assistance program, transitional work program, outplace, outplacement, and work harming interventions. Now, uh, if anybody's here has worked with somebody who maybe had a work related injury, have you ever stopped to think about what factors led them to getting that injury? And like maybe how did he get injured? Or what's the work environment like? Yeah, I'd say uh, when we when we work with our clients that are going through the workers' comp process, uh, we get all the documentation on how their work injury happened, what led up to it, uh, the environment, and um, all those situations. And uh, that documentation is provided to uh, both the insurance company and the Department of Labor and Industry. And what are some of the responses you get from those employment agencies when you do those investigations or assessments? Um, it, it's it's uh, really dependent on what their position is on the uh, the whole claim. Some employers uh, are very communicative. Others have their attorneys speak on their behalf for everything. Yeah. No, I appreciate that because it, it's important because if you think of it this way, if let's say you know one of your clients, I'm just gonna make a scenario here. One of your clients is a cancer patient or recovery wants to go to work and it's gonna be a long-term thing. You come to find out that the family history has a line of cancer. Well, depending on the type of cancer it is, let's say for instance, it's a rare type of cancer, and it only comes from being occupationally exposed to certain chemicals. And so that grandfather who was exposed to that chemical all those years begot or brought forth his offspring, that, that particular gene and, and uh, that gene, <laughs> I want to say gene, but that, that transcription of that, which led us to cancers within the family. People don't think, start to maybe think about what's around them that may could be cancerous or could affect them and hurt them and others and offspring. So that just might be also something to think about too. It's you know what is their environment like that led them up to that. If the person is a smoker and they come from a family of smokers, it would make sense that they can end up come with some sort of lung cancer. 
Um, but I, I mentioned that because if we want to reduce the amount of injuries and diseases, we also want to be proactive about it. And that's where psychoeducation comes in as far as like, okay, well, you do have a substance use disorder. Maybe we can get you with a, with a counselor to help you understand or a licensed professional counselor to help you understand about this disorder and they can teach you how to get through this. And then with that, we can also talk about uh, some of the company policies. Um, if anybody here has ever heard of an industrial organizational psychologist, pretty much they're looking at the workplace structure and how to make people work better in a healthier environment too. So the, the key here is that, yes, we do these things while we're going through that, but you also keep in the back of your mind, what are some other things that may be a factor into the person? What if the place that they're working at, if you're doing what's called a work hardening program, which can be very difficult for some, uh, might worsen the injury, you know, even if they tried going through it. So those kind of things. Just stuff to think about, okay? Now with that, I should really have Andrew talk about this here, but I'm gonna talk about it. Uh, we have what's called the workers' compensation laws and practices. You have the state mandated insurance programs. Remember I was telling you about earlier about the group disability insurances? Very similar. And what that does is that provides a partial replacement of an individual's lost wages as compensation for accidental job-related injury or illness that is not self-inflicted or caused by intoxication or substance use. Those are key terms there. Also guarantees confirmation compensation benefits to workers who forgo most of their rights to sue their employer in the events of an injury. It's described as a no-fault system. Benefits are paid regardless of who is at fault for the injury as long as the injury or disease happened at work or was caused by work. That's where a workman's compensation claim comes into play. Persons who are injured become ill and job receive money to replace lost wages. They're also eligible for medical expenses, care, and VR services. So these are the four main goals of workmen's compensations, or workers' compensation. Provide injured, ill workers with prompt medical care and wage replacement, establish a process of addressing workplace injuries that decreases legal costs and relatives of the judicial system in heavy case loads and personal injury cases, alleviate the demands on financial, medical, and rehab services that emerge from an occupational injury and illness and establish systems and process for delivering workers' compensation benefits, resources, and services. Also, there's something about the TTD and TPD. Andrew, do you know anything about those terms by chance? I'm leaning on you here. Yes, yes, I do. Uh, the TBD is the uh, when an individual is uh, he has a <clears throat> he or she has a work-related injury, uh, but can perform. Um, the uh, work of injury or the date of injury uh, position with moderated or in a moderated position um, with you know accommodations and so forth. So like light duty, they can work with restrictions. The TDD, uh, they're restricted completely. Um, both have a certain amount of weeks too that they can uh, be dependent on. So. Oftentimes what happens is if an individual is going through the workers' comp process and they have an attorney, uh, they'll, they'll uh, try utilizing uh, the TTD as long as they can. And then uh, if it comes to the point of exhaustion, then they obviously have to go to the TPD um, and they have to work with the restrictions if need be. But um, yeah, there's a whole there's a whole system to it. It's it's pretty interesting to work in. Hmm. Appreciate the, the insight on that. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of it. And I hear that's a big growing field. I think they're also doing, I wonder if they think they already have the presentation for it, but they're doing an update with vocational they have regarding uh private uh forensics rehab counseling as well as this. So with that too. Uh, they also have what's called a return to work hierarchy workers conversation. I'm not going to read all of it, but you can definitely read it on your own, but it's, it's ultimately the same thing. The end goal, like any rehab counselors, get these people back to jobs. Any questions, thoughts, concerns, or anything about what we discussed about today? No, everything was good. 
Rose, I want to say thank you so much for uh, collaborating with the, with us on sharing this here. I, I think this here was a good good chunk of it. This chapter was a little bit big, but it has some good resources for you. And I hope it helps you think about, especially if you're like myself, get into a new career, what specific areas you want to work into, whether it's case management, the rehabilitation part. Yeah, you can even work for health and health promotion and wellness with your field and rehab counseling because you're facing injuries, illnesses. And of course, you got workman's compensation. So with that, uh, again, thank you, Rose. Uh, thank you for everybody who did chime in here. I'm going to start recording, but I do have something I want to share with you.